have your Bible this morning, if you would open it please with me to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, beginning at verse 34. I read this morning as I usually do from the King James text. We'll begin at verse 34, Acts chapter 10, standing in honor of the reading of God's word, and the word of the Lord reads, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. And this morning I want you to pay really special attention because you're going to notice that in parentheses here, Peter makes a comment and it's not in parentheses. He said, He is Lord of all. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, which was published, excuse me, uh, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, and then in parentheses it says, He is Lord of all. That word I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea, and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him when, after he rose from the dead. Amen. That means he physically, literally arose from the dead. He did not emerge a spiritual being. A spiritual being has no need to eat or drink. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. You remember I preached several weeks ago, who does the scripture tell us plainly is the judge? Jesus. God is the judge. And it says here that God hath ordained that he be the judge of the quick and the dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. I just want to talk to us and exhort us this morning on the topic of the who hinge. The who hinge. Master, we love you this morning. We thank you, God, for your word. For we know today, Lord, that your word is exalted above everything. And Lord, today a man's uh, value is in his word. A man's name is worth nothing if he doesn't keep his word. And we know that your name is good because your word is uh, preferred above everything, including your name, that your name might follow and that your name might be trustworthy. And Master, today as we come into this time in our service, we pray, God, that your anointing would rest heavily upon this service. Let the Holy Ghost reside upon every word that I would speak, God, that we might faithfully deliver that word which you placed in my spirit for this moment in time. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Amen. I was watching Pat Robertson on television several days back, and Pat Robertson was going through this great big long emotional speech and spiel about all that the Lord Jesus Christ had done for us 
as humanity. He kept using phrases like, God loves you. Jesus died for you so you can live. He lived the perfect life. He died this miserable, horrible, painful, terrible death. And as I sat there and listened to Mr. Robertson saying all of this, for a moment the Holy Ghost kind of spoke to my heart and said, I want you to listen to what he's saying from the perspective of an unbeliever. I want you to listen to what this man is saying from the perspective of someone who does not believe the gospel, who has not believed this story that the apostles of Jesus Christ had borne witness to. So I want you to try to listen for a moment as an unbeliever. So I did. And you know what I found myself saying? I found myself answering Pat Robertson's many uh, comments and statements by saying, so what? You're not telling me anything. So what? God loves you. So what? That doesn't change my life. My life's still miserable. My life's still out of whack. Everything's still a mess. So what? Amen. Well, no, no. Jesus Christ died so that you can live. So what? Yeah. Amen. I'm living now, but it's not, you know, so what? You're not really giving me anything substantive that would make me want to believe the gospel. But when we look in Acts chapter 10, as the Apostle Peter is speaking to the house of Cornelius, which were Gentiles, they were not believers, they did not know that Messiah had come, but as Peter in our primary text is speaking to the house of Cornelius, it's interesting that as he, he kind of gives a very brief little breakdown of the life of Christ and the death of Christ. But you know, as he doesn't go into some big spiel trying to stir up emotion about how the Lord died. How many times have you gone to church and you got to hear a preacher carry on for 20 minutes about the crucifixion? Yes. All of these miracles that were as big as trees were given to us. Oh, hallelujah. All of these forms that were given. Yeah, and they exaggerate everything. Yes, they do. And they carry everything to the extreme because somehow that's going to make the emotional burden on the hearer heavier. That's right, amen. And they try to make the story sound so big as if a little big flatulate really happened. Amen. My Lord have mercy. Yes, amen. And they try down and they make it into something that perhaps it wasn't. And they think that in doing this that the unbeliever is going to be driven to his knees. But in the middle of Peter's comments to the house of Cornelius, he inserts a little phrase in parentheses that becomes the hinge of the message. Amen. Everything about the gospel of Jesus Christ hinges upon one simple fact. And Peter said it in Acts chapter 10 and verse 36 when he said the word which God sent unto the children of Israel preaching peace by Jesus Christ and then the hinge. He is Lord of all. Hallelujah. If your preachers would preach that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. All of us. Everything. Everything he did. Everything he said. Everything takes on a brand new import. Suddenly it becomes so much more impressive. Suddenly it becomes so much more powerful because the reality is it's not just a man who uh, died on the cross of Calvary. It is not just a man who did these great things, but he is Lord of all. And Peter spoke as a Jew to Hebrew Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord, and therefore he is declaring definitively and sovereignly of the Lord Jesus Christ and everything about this Bible hinges on this one truth. Amen. He preacheth on 
especially from Blue. Many of you don't know who he is. That's right. The doors are open. For the doors open, you need a healing. Amen. Amen. Everything hinges. Everything rests on the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know the problem with most of these preachers today that are preaching a false message and they're preaching a false gospel. Some say that they were born. Brother Mara, that's kind of a harsh statement. No, it's not a harsh statement. It's the truth. My friend, if you prayed along with Pat Robertson or Benny Hinn or any of these on television and they told you, now you're born again, they lied to you. That is not what the Bible says. But you see, the problem with these that preach a false gospel, the problem is they don't have the hinge. They're not preaching the who hinge. They're not letting people know who it is that did all this because if you would concentrate on the who, the way, the where, the why, and all of the other questions really don't even matter because what the saved hinge is on is the who. My Lord, have mercy. Wow. Again, I sat there and pondered the words of this preacher on television. And from the perspective of one who does not believe the gospel. And I thought to myself, you know, a sinner, an unbeliever probably would just be sitting there thinking today, well, so what? After all, the issue upon which all that the Lord did for us and everything he offers us hinges on his identity. Who he is makes what he did important for us. That's right. Amen. Amen. And if we do not focus on who Jesus Christ is, then anything and everything he did means nothing to anyone. If we do not focus on who he is, then anything and everything he did means nothing to anyone. We must focus on who he is. When you talk to the unbeliever, when you talk to sinners, when you talk to those that don't know the truth, the most important subject you can talk to them about is the identity of Jesus Christ. Because everything else hinges on that. Yes, amen. 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 A thousand people today can say, I love you. That's right. But when that one person who we really need to hear it from says it, suddenly the words take on a brand new life and a brand new meaning. So it is with the gospel of Jesus Christ. When humanity first contemplates the fact that this man was God in human form, come to earth on our behalf because he loved us, suddenly his deeds and his words mean so much more than they did when we saw him as merely a man. That's right. Amen. You hear what I'm telling you today? It makes a lot of difference, Tommy, who's saying it. Amen. Makes a world of difference who's saying it. I mean, you know, we people give you a hug in church. Oh, I love you, I love you, I love you, yeah. yeah. And then when you ask them for a ride to work, they don't have time to give you a ride to work. Yeah. They don't have any use for trying to help you when you need a little bit of help. Yes, amen. But you see, when that person that you love more than anything in this world, and that person whose word is more valuable to you than anybody else on this planet, when they say, I love you, all of a sudden, those words mean so much more than they did coming from Sister Jones over here. That's right. They mean something different to you even than your mother saying it or your dad saying it. Right, amen. That's right. You see, who's saying it means a lot. And the hinge of the gospel is the who. When you understand who did all this, all of a sudden all that he did becomes that much more important and it becomes that much more powerful. Amen. 
I'm actually selling the camera every roughly eight or ten minutes because I've been having trouble trying to edit it. This will allow me then to have ten minute segments that hopefully I can upload to the internet without having to edit it to get them. Okay, so just in case you don't hear that, I'm doing that. So we know that when the right person says, I love you, it means something. But when any old Tom, Dick, or Harry off the street or second group on the church say, it doesn't mean a whole lot to you. And this is why the who, the identity of Jesus Christ, is the hinge upon which the entire gospel rests. Right. Because, my friend, it changes the whole tenor of the story. When you understand who he is, all of a sudden everything he is has a whole new meaning. It has a whole new import for us today. You see, Jesus Christ spent the majority of his time in ministry, listen to me carefully now, trying to reveal to humanity who he was. Not what he could do. Oh, that's right. Amen. That's right. When they wanted a sign, he said, no. You see, the sign, you're not going to get a sign. That's right. Amen. He said, no, I'm not, I'm not here trying to play parlor tricks. I'm not here playing games, trying to show you what I'm capable of. When I do what I do, I do it because of who I am, because I can do it. Amen. Why did I do it? Because I can. Amen. Amen. When you read in the scripture about the New Testament, in Matthew chapter 14 of the Lord Jesus Christ walking on the water, why did the Lord walk on the water? So his disciples could see who he was. Amen. Why did the Lord heal Peter's mother-in-law in Luke chapter 4? So his disciples could see who he was. Why did the Lord raise Lazarus from the dead in John chapter 11? So that his disciples could see who he was. Why did the Lord heal the paralytic or the paralyzed man in Luke chapter 5? So that the disciples could see who he was. Why did the Lord turn the water into the wine at Cana of Galilee in John chapter 2? Because he wanted his disciples to see who he was. Why did the Lord heal the epileptic boy in Matthew 17? So his disciples could see who he was. Why did the Lord feed thousands with what amounted to a box lunch in Matthew chapter 14? So his disciples could see who he was. Why did the Lord heal the lady that was born blind in John chapter 9? So his disciples could see who he was. Why did the Lord command the stormy sea to cease in Matthew chapter 8? So that the disciples could see who he was. Why did the Lord restore the Roman soldier's ear cut off in the garden of Gethsemane in Luke chapter 22 to show his disciples who he was. He didn't need man's help. If he wanted help, he went around on the angel of heaven. He felt called to defend them. He said, let the man take his ear back. I don't need your help. Do you understand who I am? Glory to God. Why did he command demons to come out of the lunatic? To show his disciples who he was. Why did the Lord call life back into Jairus? daughter's dead body in Matthew 9 to show his disciples who he was. Why did he heal the wicked man's hand in Matthew chapter 12 to show the hand of the, uh, the withered hand of the man in Matthew 12? Why? To show his disciples who he was. Why did he cleanse the lepers in Luke chapter 17? To show his disciples who he was. Amen. My friend. Yes, amen. Why did he rise from the dead? Oh. What did he do? 
Lord to show his disciples who he was. The hinge upon which everything in this gospel resolves is the who, not the what, when, where, or why, but the who. That's what is more important than any other issue. If the, if the unbeliever is to believe the gospel, they must first hear and believe. The Bible said if, if a man would come to God, he must first believe what? That he is. You gotta know God. You gotta know about God. You gotta understand who God is if you're going to understand anything else. Because everything hinges on the who. Everything Jesus Christ did in this life was to reveal to us who he is. Notice I didn't say who he was. That's right. He is. He is. Who he is. That's right. Now listen in John chapter 2. Listen to what the apostle John said. Listen to how he worded it in verse 11 concerning the turning of water into wine at the wedding of Cana of Galilee. John says, the beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee. Amen. Now listen to this next phrase. And manifested forth his glory. Manifested forth his glory. Not the glory of the Father. He manifested forth his glory. Every miracle he did was a revelation of his person and his identity. Everything he did revealed to us who he is. Because everything in this gospel hinges upon who we're talking about. My Lord, have mercy. Those who do not know the whole truth about Jesus Christ tend to preach more about what he did yes, amen. than they do who he is. Amen. And the world gives a collective yawn and says, who is he that I should care? Amen. Amen. That's right. Amen. Okay, this man died on a cross. Yes, he was miserably, miserably tortured and tormented. But who is he that I should care? Yes. They were miserably tortured even for good causes. They were needy while they suffered greatly for good causes and good. But who is this man in particular that I should even care? Why should he stand out? I'll tell you why he stands out. Because he was your creator, your redeemer, your revealer. And when you understand who he is, everything else hinges upon this one truth. Hallelujah. Who glory. Praise the name of the Lord today. Are you getting this? Amen. Yeah. Praise God. Amen. Everything he did was a revelation of his identity. All of the gospel of Jesus Christ, not parts of it, all of it hinges upon who he is. Not his teachings, not his deeds. Who he is makes what he said worth listening to. Yes, amen. Yes. Who he is makes what he said worth listening to. Amen. Because of who he is, you better pay heed to what he said. Yes, amen. If you want who he said he is, then my friend, his word is no better than Confucius. Yes, amen. Come on now. Amen. His word is no better than Hare Krishna. His word is no better than Mooney up there in New York. His word is no better than uh, Joseph Smith. His word is no better than Mr. Russell. If he was not who he said he was. Amen. But because of who he is, all of a sudden every word that comes off of his lips takes on a whole brand new import. And you better take heed. Amen. 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 Amen
as he said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Honey, if he is who he said he is, if the things he did reveal to us who he is, then baby, there is no other way to God but through the man Jesus Christ. And those GLB churches today who want to call themselves churches that don't want to embrace that reality and they don't want to preach that truth, it's because they don't understand the truth upon which the entire gospel is based. Amen. You can go to a church and they'll say, well, we teach, we believe in the teachings of Jesus. Why? Yes, amen. It's just a matter of choice. That's right. Amen. Amen. If you don't know who he is, then you believe his teachings. It's just a matter of choice. That's right. Amen. Well, others may choose to believe Confucius' teachings. And others may choose to believe uh, Muhammad's teachings. And others may choose to believe the teachings of the local man. But that's why Jesus said to Peter and his disciples, Who do men say that I am? And the apostles responded, that some say that you're this Old Testament prophet or that Old Testament prophet come back to life and some say you're John the Baptist resurrected from the dead say God who do you say that I am and Peter had the call and the courage to declare God the Christ the son of the living God I have begotten and as a Jew he was declaring my English God the promised Messiah from God you are God and you are come because our Old Testament promises are made by our God would become our Savior. Yes, amen. And your head. Amen. Woo, boy. Amen. My Lord have mercy. The who then? <laughs> Perfectly preaches on the who. Not the what, the when, the where, the why. But the who. You can answer all those questions. And if you still have the who up in the air, and you hadn't figured it out yet, then the entire gospel is worth this to you. That's right. Amen. Amen. That includes those yeah. who sit around believing that God's a three-headed being up in heaven. And that the three of them sit around talking to each other. Well, look, son, will you go to earth and die for their sins? Are you going to go any higher, brother? But what's the Holy Ghost going to do? I'm down there suffering. He can't be sitting there and do nothing. Come on, people. If you've got a concept of, of God that has him divided into the three persons and three entities and three separate beings, my friend, some wrong. Amen. You may think that you're a child of God. I'm here to tell you today, swing this in the hymns. That door don't open. That's right. Why do you think Jesus said, I am the door to the sheepfold? Why do you think he used that analogy? I'll tell you why. Because of the who. That's right. Because his identity was what everything in the gospel hinged upon. My Lord, have mercy. Then said Jesus unto them again in John chapter 10, verses 7 through 10. Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. He said, I am the door. Amen. Verse 9, John chapter 10. I am the door. Say, honey, the hinge upon which this gospel rests is my identity. It's understanding who yes, I am. Amen. My Lord, have mercy. Then my friend, I'll tell you as well today, and, and I'm closing right now, that Jesus Christ isn't who he said he is, 
then he had to have been nothing short of a delusional maniac. Amen. That's right. Amen. That's right. Does anybody run around saying he's God? Either he's God or he's a lunatic. It's that easy. There's no other way around it. You talk to any psychiatrist on this planet and they'll tell you that when somebody has a God complex, that they're delusional. That's There's something wrong with their head. And they think that they're God. Jesus Christ said it over and over and over. But not only did he say it, he showed it. So he's either a delusional lunatic and his words mean nothing. Or he's who he said he was. Amen. And his words mean everything. Right, amen. But what changes the value of his words? What makes his teaching worth listening to? What makes this gospel worth believing? Isn't why, when, where, and how? It's who. Amen. Because the gospel hinges on the who. <laughs> Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, we thank you, God, today for your word. We thank you, Lord, for this important and wonderful word of encouragement, this wonderful word of exhortation that you've given us today. Lord, help us to understand that everything in this gospel, every portion, every part of this message, it wouldn't matter that you died on Calvary. It wouldn't matter that you died on what is commonly referred to as Good Friday. It wouldn't matter that you were crucified at the time of the Passover. It wouldn't matter that you fulfilled all of the Old Testament prophecies concerning Messiah if you were not who you said you are. Amen. And if you had not proven to us by reason of your supernatural conduct that you were in fact a supernatural being occupying a natural body. Master, in the name of Jesus, we loose today the spirit of revelation that every person, God, that hears this message, everyone, God, that would see this on uh, the internet, that would hear it on the internet, we loose the spirit of revelation in the name of Jesus. I bind up this hour, God, every unclean, lying spirit, every spirit of false doctrine, we bind it up upon the authority of God's word, and we loose revelation in Jesus' name. God, let people see and understand who you are, that the power of this gospel might be loosed in their life, that they might believe the truth and be saved. For we ask it today and absolutely none other name than the only name given among men under heaven, whereby we must be saved. Amen. That name is Jesus. Amen. Praise God. And amen. God bless you today. Amen. 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 You like that pretty good. Wow. I thought I'd do it and walk this way. <laughs> well, I'm going to say now again. I would have never heard anybody say because of who he is. Pat Robertson doing that. Yeah. You know, that I've heard and it was always on the guilt trip. But do you know it never drew anything out of me? No. Not that was spiritually. It was certainly, you know, I was thinking. It might have gotten an emotional reaction. Yeah, yeah. Because like it was supposed to. This guy died for you. Yeah. Why would he do that, you idiot? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Good, I know what? Yeah. Boy, that was something. I, I, I'm going to be sending my uh, cousin an email saying, Lynn, you are a You know? Yeah. Shoot. Because I, ever since uh, that last Bible study, and we listened to your, your yeah. message, I have been feeling so good. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, just... I don't even know how to put it this. And I've just been feeling so powerful, so yeah. I don't know. I'm laying down the child of God, knowing that everything you're preaching is the truth. Yeah. And that I have him for me now, and you really feel like... Empowered. Yes, that's the word. Yeah. Empowered. Yeah. It's not powerful, but empowered. Yeah. in that way. You yeah. know, and I am a child of God. Yeah. Are you going to go to the uh, next thing? Can we? Uh,